few people come on in, and that'll be just fine. You know, in the real life world, life happens, doesn't it? And the person that was due to introduce Dr. Box and I, guess who showed up at her workplace today? The Medicaid investigators, or whatever you call that. Yes, ma'am. So guess what? She didn't get to leave early to come and introduce us. So I'm going to handle that, and we will invite her to come and introduce another time. She had practiced, and she was so excited to do it, and then she did not get to do this. So if you've been to the brown bags before, you know that there's usually a presentation, and then there's an invited response. And I would like to introduce you to Dr. Kathy Box. As soon as I'm done presenting, she will do the invited response, and I'm very tickled that she's doing that. We both got our doctorates a little bit later in life, and we've become very good friends. Dr. Box is a former science teacher who currently serves as an associate professor in the education department. She is the program coordinator for secondary education at Lubbock Christian University. She earned her master's degree in multidisciplinary science, and then she has a specialization in inquiry-based learning a PhD in curriculum and instruction. Her dissertation research investigated formative assessment in the science classroom. She currently teaches an assessment course for student teachers, teaching methods for secondary pre-service teachers, and supervises student teachers. She continually researches the best practices and investigates how students learn and what teachers should be doing to facilitate learning in the classroom. Doesn't she sound perfect to give the invited response? Yes, I'm tickled to death. Well, just a little bit about me before I get into the content. Uh, I've been a nurse for over 30 years, and at the time when my children were small, I was a school nurse, and that's when I fell in love with teaching. I started teaching at the Covenant School of Nursing in 1992, and then went on through encouragement from my LCU buddies to get a doctorate and started full-time here in 2009. And I just love teaching in the graduate program. I teach research, leadership, and the global culture and health class to Honduras. And I have two of my Honduras traveling buddies here today. So let's get going. I wanted to start with this quote. I love this quote by Margaret Mead. Have you heard this before? Never underestimate the power of a few committed people to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, why do I bring that quote to you? Because what happens when a nurse or when a teacher or when someone ha notices a phenomenon going on in the workplace? And this is typically what's going to happen to you. I have many budding researchers in this room today. <sighs> Something's going to, you're going to say, well, what is occurring there? That doesn't seem to be working very well. How could we make that better? And I want to share with you that that's what happened to me. As I was a brand new Covenant faculty member, I noticed the first semester students coming in to the first semester, these had been A students in their prerequisites, and they were failing their first exams. So I was thinking, what is going on with that? Well, were we doing knowledge versus application test items? Was that happening on the exams? And I want to talk more in a minute about rote memorization and meaningful learning. I've got that in my dissertation. I want to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Another thing I found out as I begin to investigate that there's types of knowledge. We have declarative knowledge, procedural knowledge, and conditional knowledge. So declarative is like, this is a Foley catheter. I'm going to use nursing examples because most of us are nurses, okay? This is a serum potassium level. So you know what that is. That's declarative. Procedural no knowledge would be then how do I draw a lab specimen for a serum potassium? How do I insert a Foley catheter? And then finally conditional is, well, when I get an elevated serum potassium, what do I do about it? What's the conditional knowledge that goes with that? When would I insert a Foley catheter? When would I know that my patient needs that intervention? So there were three types of knowledge. I was like, well, are we teaching at declarative and testing at conditional? 
Are we teaching declarative and testing it procedural? Tell me what's going on with these students. So do you see I had a big question mark in my mind? And that's going to happen to you. You're going to have a question mark about something that's happened and how can it be better? I also want to share with you, in the early 90s, you uh, may have read about nurses were observing incidents of pneumonia in ventilator patients. And what you begin to see was anecdotal documentation of that in the nursing literature. Nurses were making observations. And then the literature moved up the hierarchy of evidence to strong descriptive studies. And then it moved on up empirically to actually empirically, statistically based studies about causes for ventilator assisted pneumonia. And today, we have protocols for our patients that are in the ICU setting on a ventilator to prevent ventilator associated events. Do you see how that grew out of those first nurses idea of we are observing this phenomenon with our patients. Is there some intervention, something that we can do to prevent that? We could go over a lot of examples. Jamie's here today. Sepsis is the same thing. Nurses making observations and following through to do something about it, okay? This was the NLN position statement at the time I was doing dissertation, and I put this in here because at that time, nursing education did not have a strong basis for educational interventions. I could ask the nurses in this room, think back to your basic nursing training. What type of educational strategies did you experience? Predominantly, mine was very teacher-centered. It was the teacher at the front of the room sharing the information and the students sitting there and taking the notes. Most, can you identify with that? So at the time that I wanted to do this study, we really needed to move towards educational intervention in nursing schools being evidence-based. So I wanted to do a study on the best instructional methods and find the evidence that they worked well. And what was I going to look at with my students? Remember we talked about rote memorization? The opposite of that is meaningful learning. So that's what I wanted to investigate. Here's the plan for the study. Most of you that have been through a research course, this is what you're going to see. What's the background? State the problem. What's the purpose? Is this significance? It's the what if factor. Is this significant? Get into the literature. What do you find in the literature? And I'm going to share some of that with you in just a moment. What is the design of your study? And then what is your methodology? And I think many nurses, even if you're a quantitative researcher, many times you want that qualitative piece because you want the lived experience of your participants. And that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted the empirical data that was hard data, that was the numbers part of it, but I also wanted to know what did those students experience as they went through these interventional strategies. And finally then, your results and recommendations, and I'll share a few of those with you, and your conclusion. So here you see the first bullet. This is talking about that we need educational practices that are research-based. That's what I found overwhelmingly in the literature. Evidence-based teaching is the conscious, conscientious, explicit judicious use of knowledge generated through research to guide nursing practice. And finally, nurse educators are poised to be leaders in researching and teaching evidence. We do it all the time, and we are in the great position to do it. So you also know in the literature I found there was problems with nursing education. I just mentioned to you that highly they were teacher-centered. Many of the interventional strategies had no research to base that that was the best way to teach something. They, we needed a curricula that was responsive to the changes in healthcare delivery systems, that was research-based, collaborative, and applied a pedagogical innovation. You see the multiple resources there that supported this. So we had some problems in nursing education. So what's the answer? Here I see is uh, meaningful learning was one of my variables that I wanted to look at. 
Th I found this theorist, Ausubel, and his definition for meaningful learning was retention and transfer. Doesn't that fit perfect for nursing? Because in the classroom, we want to retain it. But when we get into practice, we need to be able to transfer it, don't we? I thought it fit perfect for nursing. Well, my next question is, which instructional methods promote meaningful learning? What do I need to do there? So I went back into the literature. I found this, and guys, you know, some of these references are old, but you remember that some things are classics. And this Chickering and Gameson article is a classic. I want you to remember these things that are best practices. I went into the education literature to find this. I did not find this in the nursing education literature. I went into the educational literature. Now look at these things, and when we talk about uh, teaching strategies in just a moment, you see which one of these fulfills that. Encourages student and faculty contact. Encourages cooperation among the students. Encourages active learning. If you're sitting there taking notes from your teacher, is that active learning? It could be, but possibly it could not be. You're just really trying to capture everything that your teacher is saying so that you can know Oh, I might need that for the test, right? Prompt feedback. How many of you like prompt feedback? I believe we all do. I want to know that I did well, that I got it. Give me praise. You're the expert. Tell me I did a good job. And finally, emphasizes time on task, communicates high expectation, and respects diverse talents and ways of learning. Is that a pretty tall order? Well, I think we're going to need a variety of instructional strategies, maybe. But I want you to remember this. Does this look to you like that the students are not active? Does this look teacher-centered? No. Does this look student-centered? Look how many times students are mentioned. Very much student-centered. I chose to do a mixed method. Quantitative and qualitative data was collected. And I wanted to investigate the effects of innovative instructional strategies on students' intrinsic motivation and meaningful learning. So my two outcome variables were intrinsic motivation and meaningful learning. All right? I'll talk a little bit more how we assessed those. Here are the, the instructional methods that I selected based on the literature review. Small cooperative learning groups. What I found in the literature from small cooperative learning gr groups is that your students need some guidance. You can't just turn them loose. They're, you're going to need some structure provided for the small cooperative learning groups. And that's what we did. Specifically designed case studies. There were two units in the senior semester that the majority of the students were failing. And I wanted to do something about that. I took those two units and I specifically designed case studies to bring to light those key concepts of those two unit exams that primarily the students were failing. These were the exams just prior to going into the ICU setting. So these are uh, advanced medical surgical concepts. And we wanted the students to be able to know that content prior to going into the ICU setting. And they were not doing well on those exams. So I specifically designed the case studies to bring to life those different concepts that the students needed. Then we had small cooperative learning group every morning. And the students went over what they found with their case studies. They worked among themselves. They talked to each other. Well, hey, on this, I found this. Hey, on this, I found this. And they were helpful to each other. And the last thing then we did that morning was faculty-guided group discussion. Now, we had used faculty-guided group discussion in post-clinical for years. I had done that for years with my clinical students. But I had never really taken it into the classroom and used it specifically for going over these case studies. So these were the three methods that I implemented on these two very 
uh, important unit exams with senior nursing students, okay? The quantitative results. I used multiple standardized tests that Covenant already had in place. It's their ATI testing. They do that every semester multiple times. And I pull those from their freshman, sophomore, and junior semesters. And I did MANOVA analysis on those for my standardized uh, testing results of the current students that I had in the study. So there you see I used multiple standardized tests, and then we used the teacher-generated test, the two teacher-generated tests to test the quantitative results. The results revealed the instructional strategies posit positively affected students' learning affectively and cognitively. And in a moment when I show you the certified nurse educator criteria, one of the things that they want you to do is not only teach in one domain, but to teach in the affective and the cognitive domain as well. I tell you what, that affective domain, domain is very powerful because if you can move your students to have an affective response to what you're teaching, they will never forget it. It sticks with them. Now, I want to say also, I had positive outcomes with my quantitative study. Had I had negative or not the results that I wanted, I would still have needed to report those. Why? Because other educators would need to know that I had done this study and my intervention was not successful. And they would say, we don't need to do that. Or we, let's replicate it and see if we get the same results. Happily, I was so happy. Aren't you happy when it works out how you want it to? It did prove, the, or not prove, it supported the inter interventions that I selected did help those students to have meaningful learning. And this was the quantita quantitative side. My qualitative result, I had seven qualitative participants. They kept daily journals, they participated in daily group meetings and one-on-one -on -one structured interview process at the end. They were observed in the actual interview process and the qualitative data analysis also revealed themes supporting instructional strategies, enhanced their intrinsic motivation, meaningful learning, and improved content retention. There was an area that I had looked in the literature for and I never could find an article for. You remember I mentioned to you rote memorization and meaningful learning? When I did my literature review, I found a lot of information on high stakes testing where teachers, when did they take that toss? It used to be toss, now it started. Did they take, start that in third grade? Okay, so from our little third graders on, they are under the pressure to take this standardized test. Not only do the students feel the pressure, but the teachers feel the pressure to teach it. The principal's concerned about it and the superintendent's concerned. Do you see how important those tests are? So students come to us in nursing school conditioned to study what the teacher tells them to study. Thus we have rote memorization. How many of you remember rote memorization in your prerequisites? I think about microbiology, all those genus and species. I memorized all of those so I could go in and regurgitate them on the test. It's called click and dump mentality in the literature. The thing that I wanted to find here was after click and dump, what percentage of that knowledge do the students really retain? And I could not find an article on that, so what I did in, with my qualitative participants is I asked them, did these interventional, these instructional strategies increase your content retention? Yeah, they did well on the test, that was a quantitative outcome, but I wanted to know the qualitative outcome. Did they feel that these in interventions help them to remember, and they did. I got everything from a 70 to a 90 percent retention, where they said previously they felt they would have retained about 25 percent. That was the qualitative results. I wanted to know the lived experience of the students. So you see, many of us can identify with rote memorization 
and click and dump mentality. And I went back to those freshman nursing students and I began to wonder if that's what's happening to them. They've come out of their prerequisites where they've done rote memorization in those prerequisite courses so that they could pass. Another thing I was thinking of, how many of you know an, an acronym for the cranial nerves? Yeah. I can't give it to you today because I don't teach patho and I don't use that every day in clinicals. But I knew it then. I could tell you those cranial nerves like nothing flat. But you see that was a rote memorization and it's gone. How much other valuable nursing information is gone? In nursing school, we try to teach students the ability to apply the knowledge that they have. And that goes back to my definition of meaningful learning, to retain it and have the ability to transfer it and apply it. Make sense? Let's go on. So the conclusion to my study was that it utilized a mixed method yielding a comprehensive evaluation of the success of these three instructional strategies to promote meaningful learning and intrinsic motivation in senior nursing students. And it's like I said, my study came out positive. It had positive results. I presented many times, multiple times across the nation on this study to other nursing faculty, telling them about the need for us to implement educational strategies in nursing that promote meaningful learning, okay? All right, I have a few practical applications. Activate prior knowledge. When you go into a classroom to teach, and some of you are going to be nurse educators, you want to link what the new knowledge is to what they already know because they're going to remember it. All right, let's look at some examples. You introduce new content by link linking it to previous contents. You help the students construct meaning and develop insight. Assist the students to make the connection to the new knowledge through creative student-centered educational strategies. This was one instructional strategy I found was what do you know, what do you want to know, and what have you learned? The KWL. So when your students come in and you say today we're going to learn about X. And you say, well, what do you know about X right now? And you can jot it on the board, or you can have the students write some ideas down. And then you ask them, well, what do you want to know about it? And then you go through and you teach. And then you go back to see what they wanted to know, did they learn? Do you see? Do you see how that is student-centered? That gets the student involved in what's going on class discussion and an interactive lecture style. In a moment I'm going to show you the learning pyramid and at the very top 5% of retention of knowledge is lecture. So sometimes lecture gets kind of a bad rep. But let me tell you, you can do interactive lecture style. Periodically you can stop and ask your class a question. There's a new marketing these guys want to sell you these clickers, okay? So all your students get clickers, and they want to sell them to you, and there's a pretty penny for them. But then all of a sudden, through your lesson, you can start with a question, and all the students click on the answer that they think it is. It's a cool way to keep them cognitively engaged with you as you're going through the lesson. It can be expensive, but if your school can afford it, how cool is that to have clickers? I've been at conferences and they've let us play with them and they've put questions up on the board and we can see oh 68 percent got it correct oh 32 missed it you know so you, it's fun it's fun student-led presentations another thing on the learning pyramid you're going to see in a moment when you teach something you remember it it's high retention rate so student-led presentations are going to promote the student really learning the content and I still have a favorite, I still love small cooperative learning groups with specific guidelines provided for your students. You're going to have to give them a little bit of structure. They're not going to be able to do that just off the top of their head. Here's the learning pyramid. I love this. This comes out of the National Training Laboratory. So like I said, le uh, lectures at the top, 5%. I think that would go back to those lectures that I had in nursing school where it was, oh, it was so strong, teacher-centered. 
no interaction with the student. And it's almost like when I first started teaching. Do you know when I first started teaching, I had 180 students in that old school of nursing over there by Covenant. The big old room, 180 students, and I'm sitting there with my knees just a knocking. And, and you know what I was thinking about? This is everything I need to tell my class today. And I'm not even looking at my students to see if they're making eye contact with me and they're with me on what I'm saying. That was a novice educator. Today, I'm looking at your eyes. I'm looking at you. Are you with me? Are you following me? Does that make sense? Yeah. So lecture can be a very poor instructional method, but I believe it can be improved on if we have ways of getting our students to be engaged with us as we go through. Reading, think about these. Audio visuals, look how it increases. The, as we go to the bottom of the pyramid and we increase the student involvement, the retention of knowledge increases, doesn't it? Look at the very last one, teaching others. If you have student-led presentations, they're going to remember that content. They're going to remember what they taught. Very wonderful tool. Now this is just a couple of thoughts from the Certified Nursing Educator curriculum. They want you to foster the development of your learners. There's multiple things. That's a big blueprint. I just brought you a few things. But cognitive, psychomotor, and the affective domains. I told you a moment ago how powerful the affective domain is. If you can tell a story or you can bring a testimony, something that is very moving, students get the concept. They'll grasp on. So we want to implement a variety of teaching strategies that are appropriate to the content. Learner needs, learner style, desired learning outcomes, the method that you're delivering it, whether it's face-to-face, -face, remote, or simulation. Use teaching strategies based on educational <coughs> theory and evidence-based practices related to their education and assessment and evaluation data to enhance the teaching learning process. Are you getting what I'm saying? Instructional method is so huge and important. Here's number two. Decrease rote memorization through active cognitive processing. That means get your students cognitively linked with you as you're going through the content. Let's look at some discussion. You want to assess the method that you are presenting new content. Are you stimulating the student's curiosity about what they're going to learn about? Are you just going in and you're telling them? You're not going to be as successful. Are you presenting teacher-centered or learner-centered units for content? Consider how you're testing. Is your testing requiring that your students do rote memorization? Consider how you're assessing what, what they've learned. Consider other tests of knowledge, such as projects requiring a demonstration. Where was demonstration on that? Look, 30%. You've increased it. Application of concepts, discussion of complex scenarios, which are case scenarios, discussion or essay explanation as opposed to multiple choice, fill in the blank or short answer test questions. What's the trouble with this? You remember my class of 180 students? Do you think I want to grade 180 essay test? Oh, I could be here till Christmas doing that. You see, we've got to have some judgment with these things, but we want to be looking at how are we assessing what our students are learning, okay? Let's go to the next one. Promote the ability to retain and transfer knowledge. We do not want to be prom promoting rote memorization. All right, let's see the uh, discussion on that. We're going, to, we're going to use real life examples. This goes back to case studies and how this new knowledge can be implemented. You need to be up to date with current best practices for promotion of the retention and transfer of knowledge. This means faculty need to be up to date on best clinical practices, right? We cannot be the teacher that hasn't been in the clinical setting for 20 years or 10 years or even five years ago. You have to be up to date. And the teacher has the responsibility to do that. Simulation in nursing is huge. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the next thing I want to talk to you, I talk, mentioned the clickers to you, uh, the bookends. Have you seen that? I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I tell you, and then I tell you what I told you. You see? It's the bookends thing. Or what is known? What do you want to know? You stimulate that curiosity of your student. Simulation in nursing education has been just huge. I want to show you this study. I, I did a, a, just a real informal search of CINAHL plus full text articles. From 2000 to 2005, I found, these are my search terms, simulation, nursing, and education. There were 30 full text articles from 2000 to 2005. Look what happened the next five years. 284. And, to, and I, to this year to date, 2010, we are on target to have 512 full text articles related to simulation in nursing education. It has exploded, hasn't it? So you think about what was happening in nursing education to promote that. One thing is nursing school started increasing enrollment because they wanted, we felt like the baby boomers were going to begin to retire and we needed new nurses in the pipeline. The other thing is, as nurse, schools of nursing increased their enrollment, our clinical spots got very tight, didn't they? So now, we didn't have as many clinical openings to take our students for clinical experiences, so we can, let's do simulation with them. And let me tell you, the marketing people have jumped on that. Those high-fidelity mannequins can run in the 120s. But they do everything, don't they? They can have breath sounds, lung sounds, heart sounds, and even deliver babies so that the students get that experience. Another area that's very difficult to find clinical experiences for students is in psychiatric and many times pediatrics, especially like through the summer months when the kiddos are healthy. It's very difficult to find clinical spots. So you can design simulations to meet those needs of those areas that you have difficulty finding clinical experiences for. It's not only excellent for teaching, technical teaching, what do you do if this is happening, but it's also wonderful for socialization. Many topics like poverty, ethics, culture, and end of life. I don't know if you've ever been with a student before that this is the first time they've seen someone die. It is very traumatic for them. If you can have a simulation experience prior to that, and you can go through and debrief about the experiences of a peaceful death. Because don't we in America want to fight death to the bitter end? We, don't, we shouldn't be feeling good about somebody dying. But if it's a peaceful death, and that's what the patient wanted, we need to help our students work through those feelings. So simulation is phenomenal. Now the National Council for State Board of Nursing have just completed a big study. No one would come out and say, Okay, if your clinical experience is X amount can be simulation. But recently we've heard it can be up to 50% if the people who are conducting the simulation are trained and certified. They want the simulation experiences to be close to real life and to be quality. If you're going to be substituting simulation experiences for real life clinical experiences, okay? Number four, promote graduate nurse success through the ability to function well in the healthcare arena. And this goes back to being current. This comes out of the Wiggins and McTie or, uh, book. The teacher's crucial role is designing the right experiences. Real life accurate case studies are powerful. Role play is powerful. <coughs> you promote an atmosphere of support and expectations that questions and concerns will arise. You have to promote this with your students. I have been in classrooms, and when I'm in class, I expect my students to talk to me. And I have been in classes where the students have not been used to that. And I have to wait, and I have to encourage them. I want you to respond. I want to hear what you're thinking. And a teacher is the one. Design the right experiences falls on the teacher for that success in learning to happen in that classroom. 
And the last one then is promote faculty scholarship. I told you at the beginning that faculty were, uh, they were poised to do this. We do nursing education every day in a cutting edge discipline. And nurses are poised to be the ones to do this. Whether it's actually conducting the research or reading and studying and implementing new educational practices, educators need to be on the cutting edge of pedagogical practices. We must be willing to try new things and effectively evaluate the success of these new practices and continue the use of the practice or terminate the practice from their educational strategy. Constant, ongoing evaluation of your educational practices is imperative for us as educators. I love Dr. Seuss. Today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. The more that you read, the more things you will know, and the more that you learn, the more places you'll go. One more. I'm a big quote person. I, I believe that uh, Wendell, all over Wendell Holmes had this right. It, the important thing is not where you are, but what direction are you moving? I have one more thing I want to say to you. If you've ever watched the movie The Emperor's Club, it's about a very wonderful teacher. And at the end, his students give him a plaque. How many of you have seen Emperor's Club? You remember at the end, Mr. Hundert, his students give him the plaque. I'm going to read this slowly. I'm sorry you visual learners might not stick. Go see Emperor's Club. A great teacher has little external history to record. Their life goes over into other lives. These teachers are the pillars in the intimate structures of our school. They are more essential than its stones or beams, and they will continue to be a kindling force and a revealing power in our lives. I want to leave you with the thought of, I want you to think back to a teacher who you absolutely loved because they challenged you, they made you think, and you learned. I have to go back to third grade, Mrs. Moorhead. Oh my goodness, Mrs. Moorhead weighed 250 pounds. She was the sweetest lady in the world, this big old smile. But those third graders learned under her, and I loved her. I want you to think about the teacher that touched your life and helped you to learn. And when you become an educator or when you're teaching, you remember them and you do a great job. And thank you very much. You, you were engaged. I saw your eyes. You were with me. And I, I welcome uh, Dr. Box to the podium now for uh, her invited response. Thank you. Very much. Wow, that was amazing. And, and you know, it's always exciting for me over in education to come and see um, education at, at work. I teach general education, uh, but to see that, that knowledge and that stuff being applied in a very, very useful way, in a very practical manner, it just warms my heart. So I want to tell you thank you, Dr. Ford, for your fine work that you have done in education. Um, and I have a clicker here, don't I? Okay. Um, I want to I want to talk about a few things, and and first of all, I do want to thank my my nursing colleagues for being on the cutting edge of of so many things. It, teaching being one of them, and how we educate our students is so important. The easy thing to do, the easy thing to do, would be to just revert to what we've always done and continue to do things like we've always done because that's our habit and our tradition, and and. A, a, a very important point that she made is sometimes we tend to teach like we learned. I know in education, um, folks in education usually are good learners. And we can learn through, through rote memorization sometimes, and so we tend to teach that way. And that's not how everyone learns. And so um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, the min in a minute. But um, there are two things that we know uh, about education and about educational research, and I wanted to share a few things with you. First of all, years ago when I first started in education uh, as a student, we behaved on, uh, we 
depended on the behavioral sciences to learn and study how people learn. We looked at the outcomes. We looked at their behavior. Well, with the advent of technology um, and cognitive sciences and the things that we can do now that we couldn't do before, um, we can scan the brain as people are learning, as people are taking in information. We can scan the brain and see what parts light up. We can, we can study neuronal development and, and that construction of knowledge can be actually seen in the study of the brain. And see, we didn't have that. Like, well, some of you are recent in school. People my age, when I was growing up, that, that research was not there. Well, in 1999, this book was published, and this changed my life, if I can just say so myself. This changed my life. It's How People Learn Brain, Mind, Experience in School. It was published by the National Academies Press uh, in 99, or, or maybe it came out in 2000. And what they did, what these folks did, is they put together cognitive science, development, developmental and behavioral um, research and put it all together to figure out how people really learn. And now that we know how people really learn, it changes what we do to teach. And, and that's what is so exciting. And so as she's talking, I'm like, has she read this book? Does she know everything that you talked about um, is, is grounded in, in what I read in here that really changed how I, I teach and how I, I teach my teachers to teach when they go into the classroom. Um, one of the most important ones is that I, idea of transfer. Um, and I'm going to see if I can go back, if I can manipulate her um, PowerPoint. We're going to go back to that about transfer. That is probably one of the most significant findings um, that has changed how we teach. And, and it cuts both ways. Here's what we know. If somebody really understands something, they can transfer it to, an, to another uh, application. Right? If I can see somebody taking knowledge and transfer it, I know they understand it. it. It works both ways. That idea of transfer is ever so important. Um, Ausubel promotes that, um, and Brown, you, you quoted Brown, or you cited Brown, and I wonder if Brown is also an author of this, but uh, Wiggins and McTie do a whole chapter called Understanding, Understanding, and, and for us to understand understanding, we have to understand that notion of transfer, and we know that if students can transfer the information that we give them into a new context, they've got it. When I very first started teaching, I was, a, I was a high school biology teacher and a pretty poor one when I started because I taught the way I'd been taught. I sat in a lecture hall and was the passive recipient of knowledge and I took notes and I memorized it and then I, you know, just spit it back out on a test and that's how I learned. And so when I went into teaching, that's also how I taught. Well, I was under the assumption that I could teach them the thing whatever it is, mitosis or cellular respiration or whatever, I could teach them the thing and then they could apply it in another context uh, and transfer it later if they knew it. And, and I'm embarrassed to say, I'm, I even believed, I'm sorry, I hate to confess this, I believed that students either they could think or they couldn't. And is that embarrassing or what? I didn't think I could teach thinking or critical thinking or application or transfer. I thought either they had it or they didn't. I would throw the stuff out there. I would teach the stuff. And on my test, boy, they were rigorous. They had to apply it. And over and over and over, my students did poorly. And it took me a long time to figure out it was me, you know, not, not the students. It was how students learn. And so I started thinking about how students learn and how I could teach. And, and, and my dissertation is in formative assessment. And, and I won't go into a lot about a formative assessment, but what I learned is if you assess them as they go and you figure out what they know and what they don't know, you can adjust your instruction so that they can do better. It's that feedback that you talked about. But I completely changed how I taught. And, and then I came across this book and it really changed my notion of transfer. That ability to think and reason and be able to transfer it to another situation can be taught is evidenced by this research. It can be taught, but it has to be practiced. Um, you don't throw out the material and just hope that they'll be able to apply it. You know, in, in, in nursing, there is no more obvious field than in nursing where this is so relevant. You know, frankly, I don't, I don't care if a nurse gets an A 
in anatomy and physiology if when I'm sick they can't help me get better and improve my health. If they can't transfer that in a useful way, it, it doesn't matter that they've memorized it or learned it. All right, that transfer is so, so important in what you do. And, and so the fact that you touched on that, I thought was, that is really very relevant um, to, to um, what we know about how people learn. Um, okay, so the goal of transfer then changes how we teach, and we can't do the memorization thing like she mentioned. Um, a couple of things, what I want to do is I want to look at the applications then that you proposed and, and put that in light of a, a little bit more in the light of education uh, and um, some examples from uh, my experiences. Okay, this practical application number one. And I just love that you have practical applications. And, and, and of course, that's what nurses do. It's not theory. It's how do I apply this? And I just love that. The application for you all, now that we know that students can learn to transfer, they can learn to apply, that, that it's necessary that we do that, um, we have to promote meaningful learning through activities that keep them engaged and, and uh, link new concepts to previously learned concepts or activate prior prior knowledge. What this is called in, in, in education, we talk about constructivist, constructivism. This is a constructivist approach to learning. And what we know and, and what this book shares with us and, and, and the research tells us is that students construct their own knowledge. I can, I can tell you stuff all day and, and like she said, what did you call it? Click and dump? You know, it's there, then it's gone. You might can memorize. But if I offer you opportunities to construct your own knowledge through experiences, you will have ownership of that knowledge. So experiences are critical, hence the simulations or working with real patients. Um, just, just telling you what to do is not enough. You need to be able to have those experiences to, to make sense of it. One thing that I want to add to these findings that we need to be mindful of when we, do, when we teach through constructivist approach um, is that when we go in to teach our, our students, we need to purposefully consider misconceptions that they may have. And this is something, as, as knowledgeable as you all are and, and, and the education that you've had, you, you have what we call this giant expert's blind spot. You can't even know what they don't know. It would just blow your mind what, it, what misconceptions they have. And if you don't do something purposefully to, to make that visible, uh, you're just teaching on, on shaky ground. Here's an example. I, I've got a bunch from my science teaching days, and you, you probably have some too, but I was teaching, um, uh, it was either AP biology or just my general biology, we were dissecting pigs. And so we were dissecting pigs, and there was this young lady, and she's just digging around in her pig, and she raises her hand, Miss Vox, you know, I go over there, what, what, what's wrong, honey? She said, I'm looking, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, lo I'm looking for that third tube. She's in the thoracic ring. So I'm looking for that, that third tube. She said, I found the trachea. I found the esophagus. Now, now where's the one for liquid? <laughs> and I, I kept a straight face. I said, okay, and we're digging. Found the trachea, found the esophagus. I said, now, now, now what, are you, what is it you're searching for? She, and, and long story short, she felt that she got the trachea. She thought when you ate, solids went to your stomach. When you drank, it went down a different tube to your bladder. <laughs> who, who, who would have ever dreamed that? <laughs> Nothing about the stomach, the intestines, absorption, kidneys, bladder. No. A tube. Right to it. Um, I didn't do anything purposefully to bring out that one. You know, luckily it just, you know, emerged and I was able to then talk about you know, nitrogenous waste, and, and, and really the, the, the process. Um, there was another one one time, I had been teaching them uh, through the pigs the digestion, and we had talked about the role of the liver and, you know, producing bile and bile dumping into the small intestine and emulsifying fat, you know, so we talked about the liver and its role in the gallbladder and so forth. And, and for their summary, I had them write an essay. They were Tom Thumb and they had fallen into their father's cereal, and they had to, to write an adventure from beginning to end. <laughs> and I had, you know, then I had criteria. You had to talk about the different, um, 
you know, enzymes and the path you took. And, and I swear, I, I, out of that group, I'd have kids standing up there and they're telling their story, they're reading it, and they'd say, as I traveled, their food, right? As I traveled through the liver, and I'm going, <laughs> how did they get the notion that food ever traveled through the liver? And, and, and so I had to think back to my teaching, and, you know, they knew that the, the liver had something to do with digestion, but somehow I had misled them, or they had this previous notion that food traveled, I don't know, I, I can't even imagine, but it went through the liver before somehow maybe, I don't know. But, but what I'm saying is you don't even know what they don't know unless you do something to purposefully pull out those misconceptions. You have to make the learning very visible. So that's where when you lecture to 130 people and you're just looking at you're just talking and you're not, you don't even know what they don't know. So you have to have those conversations like you said. You have to bring out what they know. It has to be an emotionally safe classroom and that's one thing I learned really fast. You know, you cannot make fun of them for what they don't know. If they don't know it, they don't know it. And, and, and you can't ridicule them. You, can, you know, it has to be emotionally safe where they can say what they know and what they don't know and then you can build on that. So this, um, this idea of constructivism, where you activate prior knowledge, you also have to be very, very purposeful about bringing out those misconceptions because they are there and you cannot even imagine. I've got one more and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, I went to an education conference where someone had researched um, a, a group of fourth grade kids to, to figure out how blood flowed through the body. And they drew a picture of a human and they gave the kids a pen and they said, Trace the path of blood through the body. I wish I, could, I wish I had a board to draw this. Okay, just pretend. So here's a head, here are arms and legs. And these kids started at the heart. They went straight out, out, out one arm, down one arm, out, down the leg, down, down the leg, down the leg, down the, and right back. Nothing to the head. <laughs> Nothing. And, 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 and so, you know, they're just thinking blood leaves and it comes back. Well, who would have ever dreamed, okay, here's the scary part, here's the scary part. Then they turned around and they surveyed their teachers to ask them to trace blood through the body. And it was pretty poor. And these are intelligent adults. They just haven't studied how blood travels through the body. You're an expert. You know these things. You're like, how could anybody overlook that? They can because they don't know. And there are things that just don't make sense to them. So when you teach... When you activate that prior knowledge, you make sure that you're getting all those misconceptions out of the way. Then you can build uh, on solid ground. And, 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 but, but you just have to pay attention to those when you go through this constructivist approach to learning. Um, and I love, I love, love, love this. And I thought if I could add to this, I use this in my education classes too. And I thought if I could add to this, I would, do I have a pointer? Well, I have to be, let me put my glasses on to see where it is. Okay. Um, I would just right here, I'd put teacher-centered and arrows up that way and learner-centered arrows down this way. Can't you see as it goes down and down and down? The retention at 95% is completely learner-centered. That lecture and that just straight-out talk is completely teacher-centered. So we have to make that shift from teacher-centered instruction to learner-centered, like she said several times. And that's how your nurses are going to learn and be able to own the material and then transfer it, um, which is our indication of understanding. Okay, on this one, um, to promote, uh, to decrease rote memorization through active cognitive processing, I will just tell you there are some really good strategies um, for designing lessons that do this very thing. And, and I won't go into them because you, you don't write lesson plans and you're not worried about that. But if you've ever heard of the 5E learning cycle, it's a, as opposed to Madeline Hunter. When I used to write lesson plans, it was Madeline Hunter, which was very direct instruction. The 5E learning model has students engage, uh, and it creates some cognitive dissonance where they're like, they want to know, and it does a little formative assessment to find out what those misconceptions are. Then they engage in whatever it is they're studying. You don't just tell them. They look for patterns. They figure things out. They analyze case studies. They do this first, like those small group things. Then they explain what they learned. And then you explain what we've missed, what, you know, you put a bow on it, you get the vocabulary correct and so forth. And then, this is the best part, then you elaborate, which means you take what you learn and you transfer it to a new situation. We can 
help students learn how to transfer. We, we can help them learn to apply, and in this model, we do, and then the fifth one is the 5E. So in education, we've learned that there's a way to structure our lessons that promote these things that she's talking about. Um, in, in this one, promote the ability to retain and transfer knowledge. Let me look at my notes. I, I may have got, gotten off here a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, just real quickly, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, it, she says here uh, that I just love, to persist in the face of difficulty. Uh, there, a host of research has been done uh, by Carol Dweck and others, and it's called uh, um, Students That Have a Growth Mindset as opposed to a Fixed Mindset. If students believe that they can learn if they try hard enough, if they put effort into it, if they're given the opportunity and, and persist, if, if they have that mindset that that's how they can, they will learn better. If they think that intelligence is like a gift from God, either you got it or you don't, you know, uh, and they, they won't be able to learn or they don't learn as high as they can. So this growth mindset goes into this thing about persisting and that's something that it's really important that we help our students know. You know, when they say, I just don't get it, you say, well, you don't get it yet. We're, we're working on it and, and, and you can get it if you persist and if you study and if you try and if you put effort. A um, lot, of, lot of studies on this and, and how we give feedback. In education anymore, we don't say, you're so smart, like on a paper. It's not a matter of being smart because then they think if they don't get it, they're just dumb. Not that they can study enough and, and learn and so forth. So that growth mindset is very important there. Um, this next one, number four. Promote a graduate nurse's success the ability to function well in the healthcare arena. Um, theory to practice through design of strategies reflective of contemporary healthcare trends. Well, um, here's here's what you already do well, I just want to affirm that this, this works. What we know about theory to practice through design of strategies is that students learn best in context. You all know that, right? That's why we do case studies. They learn best in context. When I first started teaching biology, I, I would say, okay, now we're to the mitosis chapter. I'm going to teach you mitosis. And I'd go through and I'd teach mitosis. And I'd do all the things that good to, we'd do, you know, manipulatives, we'd color them, we'd draw them, we'd look at the onion skin underneath the, you know, the different cells. And, and we, we studied mitosis and over and over, then I'd get them to try to apply it later, uh-uh. They'd forgotten it, that click and dump thing. It was like, who cares about mitosis? So what? And I found a really, really neat um, unit that was put out by the NIH. Um, and it was on cancer. And so I taught a unit on cancer. And y'all know cancer is just mitosis gone awry, right? Cells that keep going through the cell cycle over and over when they're supposed to stop. And when I started teaching about cancer, and then it's like, well, if you're going to understand cancer, I need to, we need to talk about mitosis and where that goes. The learning went way up. And so I want to encourage you as you teach your students to teach them in context. Give them the context up front and say, this is why we need to know this and this is the situation. Rather than that linear, I was so linear in how I'd teach that thing, then that thing, then that thing, then that thing, you know, and think they could apply. No, you put it in context of need to know and I promise you they will have ownership and be able to transfer it a little um, better. And our last one, I love this. I love this and you do it already. You do, you do this already. You look at a patient and, and you, you figure out what went wrong and what could I do better. You, but, I, but you should be very purposeful about it. In education, we call it practice-centered inquiry. You know, at the end of the day, when, when, when you've, you've made your analysis and you've done your work, you, you step back and you purposefully take time to reflect on what happened that day. What went well, what didn't go so well, what trends you're seeing what adjustments you need to make, and, and if you will be purposeful about reflecting, um, then, then you have that opportunity to grow in your knowledge and, and then to share it with others. Your job, and y'all do it very well, is sharing it with others. And, and um, you realize the importance of that because you save lives. 
and and that's that's why I, I think it is so important that you continue to do that in education you know we're not so good about that sometimes because um, it's not life or death but for you all it is and so that practice centered inquiry is very very important um, I don't know what time I'm supposed to be be through y'all can just tell me I could talk forever I could talk forever and um, she mentioned the flipped classroom if you're going to be teaching and you're going to be working with with uh, learners you need to, to look at using technology um, that's another thing that has completely changed how we learn and how we teach and, and what she said about memorization why should, I took I remember a, a plant taxonomy class I took and I had that giant book where I'd key out all those plants, and I could name the genus and species of all these plants. I didn't know their common name, you know. I could say, oh, that's Gossipium, here, suit them. But I didn't know, <laughs> I, didn't know it, I didn't know its real name. Um, but but I, I, at the time, I, my professor thought it was important for me to remember all those. I, it is not anymore. I can, I, I can get my phone out. I can look up anything I need to know. I could, I could find the genus and species of, of like that and so because of that we no longer need to force that yes do we need to memorize some things because you have to make split decisions and you don't want to google it <laughs> you know there are things you need to memorize but there are so many things you you do not need to anymore you don't need to memorize you don't have to have that knowledge you don't have to uh, I, I, I knew all the optic nerves too I remember and you know we have those um, um, different tricks to remember different things we don't need it now, when you get to class, instead of spending your time on memorization, now when you get to class, they can do that. They can watch videos outside of class. They can uh, watch lectures outside of class. Then when they get to class, you can have those deep discussions that you talked about. You can apply it. You can work on transferring. You can problem solve. You can reveal misconceptions. And you, your learning can, can be deep and meaningful if you flip your classrooms. But you've got to be bold. You've got to be... You got to be uh, fine with technology, and you have to help them discern. Uh, if you Google something, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of a good. Um, I can't think of uh, 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 cellular respiration. If if I Google that, I'm going to get lots and lots of different YouTube videos. You have to be able to discern and know what's best, and and so you know we have to be careful about what information they're getting out there. But if you will do that and you'll flip your classroom, I'm telling you. Your nurses will learn at a much deeper level than how I learned when I wasn't a nurse, but I was a biology major, and, and things have changed. So anyway, I just, I just love the research that Dr. Ford has done. It, it's, it's just so relevant, uh, not just to education, but, but we're talking about saving people's lives, and nurses have to be able to transfer it. And so I really appreciate um, your, your research and that you continue to promote research. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank okay. You for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Do y'all ha have any questions? I do better with impromptu questions than prepared speeches. You got any questions? Do you have a book on learning with uh, children with dyslexia and ADHD? Yes. I, I, not with me. <laughs> okay. Well, she can give you my contact information and we can help you. We well, sure can. So. Not for me. <laughs> it's it's my okay, absolutely. Any any other questions? Okay. Yes. So, at what age is it practical to teach that way to students? Is it in elementary school? Because I know, like my son, when he's studying for tests, it's all for fill in the blank, true false. I know, and no, uh, you know what the research has shown is that student or children can think in an abstract way much earlier than, than what we first suspected as far as, um, you know, putting pieces together and making sense of things from the day they're born. You know, and what we do is when they're born and when they're little and when they're at home, we, we ask those questions. What do you think? What do you see? Do you make sense? And then we get them to school and we say, here it is, memorize it. And so, so that natural curiosity and that natural, you know, it, it starts from day one. Uh, I remember my daughter came home one time, uh, second grade, she had to, to memorize the difference in a monocot and a dicot. And I was like, really? Why does a second grader need to memorize the difference in a monocot and a dicot? Y'all know that plants, a different kind of plants. Uh, and then later, the life cycle of a fern. <laughs> we kill it. So I'm just saying, from, yeah, 
<laughs> Did you have to memorize the life cycle? Anybody else have to memorize the life cycle of a fern? <laughs> See, you just memorized, click and dunk. So, but immediately, immediately we start teaching from a constructivist perspective. And, and, and we, that memorization stuff, is, it doesn't stick. And nor does it for standardized tests. We keep doing that for standardized tests, and they're doing poorly on the standardized test because the questions are phrased a little bit differently. Yeah, and they can't apply it because they memorized it this way. So we're, we're shooting ourselves in our foot even on s standardized tests. Yes? You know, nursing has, I have to tell you that, it, I've been a nurse educator for a while too, but um, nursing kind of has it right in that we teach the classroom theory and then go put it in practice right. with, with the patient. Right. So it helps with that learning if they get that particular mm -hmm. type of learning, you know, to practice that on the patients. Yeah. Um, but the evaluation end of it, was talking about how, what did I learn, how did I use that, and what could I have done better is yeah. huge. It's, yeah. it's so invaluable to be able to say, you know, I messed that up, I'm never going to do that again. Because the things that we learn the best mm -hmm. are the things we messed up the worst. Absolutely. And Absolutely. so when you, when you take the time to do that evaluation and mm -hmm. the learning is just so much better, I'm certainly going to do that and I'll do wrong this and so. And you are right. And if we could reflect on that and be fine with learning from our mistakes, not being buried. I mean, you know, we don't want to make the same mistake over and over, but we learn more from our mistakes than from reading something correctly in a book and applying it. We learn from our mistakes. Yes, sir. Well, I teach what's called neonatal resuscitation in okay. classes. I just uh -huh. got back today from going out of town. It was a small group. One of the things that we and debriefing. Good. You know, allowing them to go through the simulation and mm -hmm. let them sit down and discuss mm -hmm. maybe the mistakes they made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny to me. We live in a city, we have large medical centers. But I just wonder how many of the educators here are proud of their nurses who live in small communities and don't have the equipment that we have, and yet maintain your education and maintain your abilities. Because I worked with six, five nurses and a respiratory therapist today, mm -hmm. and I gotta tell you, I was impressed, mm -hmm. deeply impressed. Mm -hmm. They had gone through and done all the computer stuff, you know. Yeah. That's that's mm -hmm. that's beyond baby boomer, and that's what I am. <laughs> uh, all the computer stuff, we had a we were there for four hours. Twenty-five minutes of it was lecture. Just, do you remember this? Do you remember mm -hmm. this? Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And then we did simulations. Yeah. Okay. Here's the simulation. Now, go through it. Do what you need to do. And let's stop. Let's spend ten minutes on debriefing. Yeah. And, and, and the debriefing is just hugely. So you're seeing that, that it's making a difference. Well. You know, our babies are coming into our unit and they're in better shape than they were 10, 12, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this now for 10 years mm -hmm. and probably longer. Mm -hmm. We're seeing big improvement. So that's a testimony there. It just allows them to process what they, rather than moving on and moving on and moving on, it allows them to process what's happened. And, and then they have a little bit more ownership of it when they need to use it again another time. So, yes ma'am? The part about you learn best when you when you choose something with someone else is how you learn best. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've always known that and I've always believed that, mm -hmm. but I've always thought in such a small thing like a particular topic or a particular mm -hmm. process. I'm nearing the end of my first year as adjunct faculty at LCU, mm -hmm. and I have come to realize that when you are teaching a whole course, leadership and management, then it's a very big responsibility I take very seriously, but yeah. I just sort of, after a period of time, came to realize mm -hmm. that it is changing who I am. Yeah. And so yeah. my critical thinking, my behaviors, my decisions, yes. it's changing everything. My sense of empowerment as mm -hmm. a leader at Covenant mm -hmm. and the way everything is connecting mm -hmm. in, in terms of leadership, it, it's all changing. 
uh, because of my faculty experience, mm -hmm. and it's been a wonderful, joyful thing for mm -hmm. me, really. Right. And so, see, if you, why do we hog that for ourselves as teachers? Why don't we pass that on to our students mm -hmm. to facilitate the opportunity for them to do those same things mm -hmm. because they feel that same empowerment and so forth. So that's wonderful. And are we, I know we're nearing the end. We've got, Just a quick comment. I yes, ma'am. It was great. And I, it's, for those of us who aren't uh, formal faculty, it's just a reminder that all of these principles apply to our patients too. So mm -hmm. we need to be very aware oh. when we're doing patient education how important it is that we don't just lecture, that we do oh, uh, what a great. all patients and their families and that's true. Interactions. That is that's true. true. That is that's, that's a true. very good point. And then they feel empowered and, and stronger. And hopefully they'll learn better. Okay. Yeah, rather than it. Better care themselves when they don't. That's true. That's good. Thank you everyone Thank you. for being here. Thank you for those good questions. Thank you, Dr. Box, for being yeah. here. Thank and you, you guys you. watch for the next month's brown bag. Dr. Laura Upton will be presenting and it will be a wonderful program. You guys come on back. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.